Hello everyone and welcome back for episode 4 of our Sudriar campaign. You'll notice I put on a headset for this campaign um, because I haven't been able to actually listen to the music in any time because I've been recording and the music in this game is absolutely gorgeous. Now in the interest of expediency I decided to skip the part where I'm rebuilding my armies and just doing general housekeeping uh, and kind of fast forward to the good parts. The first thing we encountered was our expedition dilemma which said we'd reach the Galatian coast. Our ships leached the land of the far west western end of the Iberian Peninsula, and the coast shows a face of rocky cliffs, a flooded river, one of the rocky sections protected by a towering lighthouse built by the Romans. The people of Glacia claim kingship with the original inhabitants of Britannia. Would you like to make them your vassals, or have your men mount a raid? Now, I chose make a vassal, because after all, I'm trying to reach the Mediterranean, and I don't really want to leave some pissed off people in my wake. But my plan to attack the Orkneys quickly ran into something of a snag. Orkney decided to go to war with North Leode, Saxon Northumbria. Now, I'd already planned to attack them anyway, so this sort of was just an easy way to decline and break our alliance. I wouldn't get the surprise attack, but then again, I wouldn't have as much of a penalty either. I was again offered tribute from my enemies, this time adding cultural benefits, plus five happiness to all regions for ten turns. But as I didn't need the happiness, I might as well withhold it and keep it and see what happens if you max it the entire way. Wessex, the number one kingdom in my game, suffered a bit of a setback as the Welsh rebelled. I took advantage of my research and upgraded my Eastman Axemen to Eastman Axe Warriors, which show additional melee skill and additional charge bonus. I also learned that even raiding fleets can run out of supplies. As Orkney sailed south, it seemed like Scotland was mine for the taking, but a dilemma appeared on screen. The Kingdom of Difflin. We have some ties to people who have settled on the eastern shore of Ireland. Some of our people request that we work together with them, yet others claim we should take these lands for our own. How should we handle this? Now, I have to hold Difflin to get my victory condition, so I can kick an alliance, but unfortunately, it won't actually help us. If we ignore them, we can send out an expedition faster, but my ruler does lose influence. Me personally, I think we need to conquer them because the Alliance, while useful, eventually is going to work against us. Which then forced me into a new mission, which was conquer the Kingdom of Difflin. One of your armies has run out of supplies. Take steps to resupply them before their strength is decimated by desertion. Now, on my expedition, bringing down the Galicians proves a challenge, as they will not be able to without a fight. Finally, after a hard-fought conflict, they are forced to become our vassals. We get an additional 5 tribute, and vassalization is succeeded, and we get an additional plus 50% to industry to all regions. Uh, that's a pretty significant boost. Hopefully, that doesn't mean that our expedition is over, though. If it does, that would kind of suck. Everything seemed to be going pretty well, but Orkney was not going to forget that I betrayed them in their hour of need. I was hoping to make these a little faster to get to the next war, but things just keep happening. There aren't really any boring parts of the game. Rebels have spawned in my provinces. Now, they're not going to be too much of an issue, but I do have to finish healing up before I can take care of them. And with working and getting more pissed off by the moment, well, the time is now if I'm going to strike. Uh, their main force of uh, 20 stack is down in Northumbria fighting, and I'm easily poised to siege Dunfoyther. But have to take care of these guys first and have to get my northern army back in position to counteract any counterattack from the Orkneys. And in the south it's clear that Wessex may not have had as firm a grasp on the Welsh as it believed it had as the Welsh rebellion continues. Traditionally Wessex had a very difficult time in its entire span of keeping the Welsh under control. It wasn't until the 1300s that England really finished the conquest of Wales. Keeping going down the infantry line my shield biters have become berserkers and my Eastman Axe Warriors have become Eastman Mailed Axemen. So while Rebels hold my central territory in Renan, I actually can't resupply my army here. Uh, I didn't think about that, but they, because they're enemy in my territory, it decreases my morale. You can see it down here. It, uh, it increases my supplies and decreases my morale, so these guys can't get resupplied until I take care of the rebels in the center. It's just another way that the various systems and thrones are interact with the, interacting with each other in a very complex way behind the scenes. 
You know, and it's really these raids that are what Viking Age warfare was all about. It's not necessarily about occupation. Uh, you know, these longships would come in, they would sack a settlement, take away as much as they could, and then take it back home with them again to Norway, Sweden, Orkneys, wherever they happen to have come from. Huh. This is one of the Welsh territories that's recently seceded from Wessex, and now they want me to be their friend. Why not? I like the Welsh. And also, there's... They're far enough out that I'm never going to fight them. It is a but Orkney, on the other hand, Orkney is up to something. They brought their whole army back, and they are not weakened. I don't fight rebel scum. Reoccupy what's already mine. Low loyalty, low loyalty, low loyalty. Oh shoot. What just happened there? I guess because it has to retake that settlement. Okay. Well, this will increase happiness in all regions. And I don't think any of these increases loyalty. Let's just go for happiness right now so that doesn't happen again. Building can be repaired. Hakon has no loyalty. What in the world just occurred? What happened? Estates are low. Okay, these guys need estates is what I just learned. <laughs> so I currently have three to give, and I've got obviously a couple people here that could do for some. So drag him onto the estate there. How does this work? Right, click him, click the estate. Oh. I just need to give one guy an estate. Oh, well, I guess I'll keep my other two then, because everybody's happy again now. Ah, alright, so that one estate had already been given to somebody else previously, and when the rebels took it, I then got the estate back, so they wished my nobles wanted to remind me, hey, don't keep that one for yourself, we want it back after you take it there. That is really cool. <laughs> and they're all happy again, because why wouldn't they be? And yeah, this uh, weird estate system, um, I haven't been interacting with it too much in this game, but obviously... It uh, definitely does play a part. Um, when you think about, especially later Wessex, um, it's all about the estates. You know, you didn't have the army of of England. You had the Lord, uh, the earls of Wessex, the earls of Kent, the earls of uh, Northumbria, and each of these guys were in charge of these very huge swaths of land. And uh, when they called them into their banners, they were actually calling these individual lords who then rallied men from their local provinces. It's sort of like the fealty system that developed on the continent, but um, not quite as formalized. I'll finish upgrading these guys because this fight is coming, I can tell. I just don't want Orkney to get into my backfield there. Because if they do, there's nothing I can do to stop them. I can tell they're up to no good, though. I have enough money that I can retrain another unit. I can get three more. And basically finish out this guy's right here. Mm, can't get any more cavalry. I don't really want to use skirmisher cavalry. But I may have to just to be able to get to their archers in time. Three. And then a unit of champions. It takes us back down to one food. But this way when Orkney decides to start causing problems, I'll be roughly ready for them. So I've been asked by several people about how do I feel about the removal of certain features in the game. Um, one of them I've been asked about several times is the removal of the navy, and I don't have a problem with that one, mainly because no one had standing navies in this period. Uh, they may have had a fleet of ships that were technically owned by the crown, and that counted as the navy, but it wasn't like they had guys just sitting around specifically assigned to it. Now, Wessex may have in a couple instances, but it's still like a uh, army that can also fight on water, if that makes sense. Uh, it's not the same thing as just having a, a fleet of ships sitting around for just that purpose. Let's see if we can take Fort Rue without any issue before we uh, take out the Orkneys here. Gives us a couple turns to uh, let these guys finish healing up the rest of the way and finish recruiting. Can always use more food because more food means more people. The one system that I would have liked to have seen kept, though, is probably the religion system. Now, I understand the logic behind it that everyone was ostensibly Christian at this time, but they weren't at the same time. I've always kind of liked how the priest system works, and I especially 
still not me. Been getting really lucky with those raids. And I especially enjoyed the uh, papal system back in Medieval 2. Now I realize that the Pope isn't all powerful yet by this time, but by 1095 he's already willing to call the entire Christianity on a crusade, so it's not exactly something to sneeze at. I mean, theoretically the Pope is one of the major factors in the Battle of Hastings and about blessing William's conquest of England. So, I mean, people are clearly paying attention to what he wants. The idea of excommunication has already had a lot of power. Um, so if nothing else, I would have liked to have seen maybe a priest delegate system or, you know, maybe slowly evangelizing into the, in the north here. I mean, anything to maybe help with public order. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be a character um, because I'll admit the rock, paper, scissors of the unit types of the agents just annoyed the snot out of me that you have to have an assassin to counter the uh, priest to counter the and it just just got really annoying very quickly um especially when each of them also gave like a one percent buff to whatever it, it just became a bit of a pain as opposed to interesting plenty of food again so let's finish rounding out this army with another four or five guys our war fervor is slowly starting to die off it's back i guess to zero again it's because all these wars on our border. I don't think I'm at war with anyone right now, though. Let's check. Yeah, no. It's just people fighting around us. People don't like that. It makes them feel unsettled. It's true even today. <laughs> They're really not going to like this war with Orkney, then. And apparently another way you can spend tribute is to get experience for your generals. But I'm also doing pretty well on that, so I think I'll yet again withhold that tribute. Success is rewarded. Is she worthy? What's with the negative loyalty? Eh. Orkney has decided on a rather bold strategy. They've vacated their northern settlement and instead are committing to their fight with Northumbria, which leaves them nice and open for a bit of double crossing by me. So, foreign trespasser from Orkney on my lands. I can only assume they're up to no good, but then again, so am I. Having now besieged the last settlement of Ath Fokla, they're tied up in a envelopment. Now my question is, if I attack them now, will I Fokla come out to help me? And the answer is yes. And that's how you take care of Orkney. So their main army already taken out of the fight before I even begin the war. Ooh. And that's the way to begin a war, ladies and gentlemen. Unfortunately, though, I am sort of stuck here in the middle of winter. But I know they're going to be coming down the coast, so I might as well start making my way back now. By the same token, all these places are about to probably be routed. But that's fine, because my other army can now just start moving north towards their main capital here. I should have plenty of guys left to take care of, what, 13? That's not even very many at all. Let's see how Orkney responds. That's... Hmm. Well, we have more guys here. Why is it that we're losing? Well, I'm just going to back up and... Well, he attacks Aberdeen. Surprise. So I think I want to take a little bit and just kind of talk about historical authenticity in this game. I mentioned in a uh, post down on the YouTube from my previous video uh, that it, uh, it took a moment to actually look at the Normans and uh, the armor that they have on, the kind of the costuming of it. Um, I'm less than enthused. Uh, obviously, this game is reusing a lot of existing assets. That's just sort of a given. Uh, but... <laughs> It's one of those places I would really like to have seen a little more effort go in. Um, as far as we're still got this authenticity goes, I mean, you know, we have Vikings with great big fur cuffs around the top of their, uh, you know, the top of their armor. Is it historically accurate? Well, people wore furs during the era. In fact, it was an interesting way of keeping off uh, fleas. People wear big fur coats. When it got too bad, they would just toss it away. And also, it's really cold up north. What else are you going to wear? So armor, especially metal, if you ever had metal against your skin in the winter, you want something else between it. So, hey, maybe they did wear furs. Who am I to say? So, that kind of stuff really doesn't bother me. 
But when you have really good examples of what something should look like, in this case the Normans in the version of the Bayou Tapestry, it does sort of bother me when they don't follow that a little closer. Um, but I understand there's always a balance between budget and what you can accomplish. I mean, they're not egregiously wrong, but there's just those little minor details that do annoy. Um, when I fight the Normans in eventual campaign, I'll take a moment to put some of that out. Historical authenticity is one of those things that people like to say that's what they're looking for. Um, but in reality, if a game was perfectly historically accurate, well, I guess we're just going to have to fight this. I'm not really sure what a 1v1 ship battle is going to look like, but hey, we're going to give it a go. I mean, I have more guys. I'm not really sure why I should lose this. I mean, I'm also even a better commander. I mean, theoretically, we should just meet together and then wipe the floor with them. There was some critiques earlier on about them using the old Attila uh, draft transport ships, but you'll notice they've actually replaced those with these lovely Drakkar longships. The carved mast head, by the way, is one of the ways you can tell if a boat is a Viking boat or not. Well, at least according to sources I've read. If a, uh, this mast head was actually removable, and if a ship was coming into port without the mast head, well, then it's just a trading ship. But if it has the mast head, it means your butt. So that's an interesting way of telling a Viking ship from a trading ship that's also Norse. Now, the shields are kept along the sides for two reasons. The first being, uh, obviously, it's a nice place to stow your shields. And the second being that uh, it actually helps to raise the side of the ship so that it, you know, doesn't splash over quite so much. Alright, boys, let's get them. So, Hearthguard and Hearthguard, I have more. Not really sure what the issue is here. You'll notice I finally figured out how to turn off the unit stats thanks to several lovely commenters. I do find it funny though that as you're on the uh, in the ships, they kind of just automatically row themselves. Uh, normally, obviously, there'd be big, big benches across the middle of this, and the guys would be rowing themselves. Uh, the warriors kind of did double duty. Occasionally, on the larger ships, they might have other people, but uh... yeah, like how did they have me losing this? I mean, I have more people, and they're dead match. Of course, they're gonna win. Well, that's one of those things. If you ever see it dead even on a uh, auto resolve, go ahead and fight it yourself. You're always gonna have better luck. That's right, he is. A lot of quick stabbings, not a lot of big, like, hacking motions. I'm not sure how that caught fire, but I approve. But, I mean, a film like 300, I, I love the movie 300. It's so fun. I mean, it actually somehow manages to capture the spirit of what Spartans were thought of as, especially in the Greek world. I mean, obviously nobody ran around in superhero-style capes and, you know, fought, jumping into the air like crazy folks. But it does such a good job of giving you a feel of a lost world. And, uh, you know, sometimes historically accurate stuff doesn't do that. I mean, we could be sitting here for years and years at a time waiting to do things. I could issue a command and have to wait four turns to find out if it actually worked or not, or if one of my guys just chose to ignore me. Um, and that's just not as interesting or fun. So as great as historical authenticity can be, it can also be something of a detraction in games. And there's a fine line you walk right there between having fun and being accurate, if you will. You know, I mean, theoretically, because these guys are out at sea right now, if I leave them out there for more than a couple days, you know, more than a couple weeks raiding, they may end up getting scurvy. Um, <laughs> scurvy's not fun to play with. I may have to Benny Hill this guy a little bit. He may just keep running away from me. Yep. Nothing I can do to stop it. And yeah, Folkla folks are not doing well themselves. Might be an easy opportunity to go ahead and take Dun Kaladin since Orkney's main armies are already gone, it looks like. The sea awaits. Hmm. Good thing I went ahead and attacked this way. Um, I suppose I could have gone from the port side. Sort of weird. The, the pathing in this game does get a little odd sometimes. Uh, how if it wants you to attack from the sea or the shores especially up in the Scotlands it's very unclear always what the path is I mean you see all these beaches and yet I apparently couldn't land on any of these beaches so uh, something about weird design choice right there on the part of creative assembly apparently I folk did my job for me and uh, just hunted them down so let's just go ahead and uh, 
finish them off. You'll excuse me if I don't fight a battle that's just so wildly in my favor. And yeah, Folkla is apparently in my backyard doing crazy stuff. So let's just go ahead and take them out of the mix. But they are allied with Stratclut, who thankfully has a couple border states between me and him, so I think we'll deal with it. Ah, so that did end our previous expedition. Good to know. Well, luckily, we can send out a new one. It's one of the weird things about this Hoosier campaign. Because you're up at the very, very top of the map, I haven't been interacting with nearly any of the other factions. I mean, if I had gone raiding down south, I probably would have run into them sooner. But as is, I mean, you know, I'm kind of just up here all by my lonesome. It's a very different feeling for the campaign. All right, last time when we went directly south, if we go north, we'll probably run into Norway. We know what's in the north. Let's just go east. See if we'll make it to Russia or something. We will bring you glory. Nice standing stone circle. Any really work knees there? I'm sure someone knows what this is. I imagine it is a real geographic feature. So if anyone in the channel knows what this is, I, I for some reason I keep thinking about a bunch of puffins jumping off of it in my mind. So I watch a lot of David Attenborough nature specials, and uh, that's some, or seagulls maybe it's something related to birds. So if anybody knows what that rock is. Okay, dead of winter, but we have our siege stuff. I kind of want to see these Vikings, uh, the Berserkers in combat, so I'll see what they can do. Anytime I encounter one of the big major citadels, I always like to see what it looks like. So people asked previously how come I don't use more abilities to uh, minimize losses. Um, in this particular case, it's just an assault, but uh, you don't really have that many abilities uh, inherently in this game. There's no uh, shield wall stance, things like that. They're all just sort of built in. Uh, the shield castle is purely defensive and static, and where are our berserkers? Berserkers. Ooh, there they are. Got some Scots Tartans on there. They do have a unique ability, which is uh, the wedge, so you're going to charge in and really do some damage there. Uh, but they do have very low unit numbers, only 60 of them, as opposed to your normal unit size of 120, so literally half size. No, and uh, we do have the ability to do flaming shot. Someone asked about that, and apparently I was wrong, so I do apologize. So let's go ahead and do some flaming shot directly into the enemy here. Oh, you guys are apparently getting pushed. Get our uh, line ready to go here, and obviously horsemen and things like that not particularly useful in this battle. Now I realize people get annoyed when I put my archers up there to get eaten like that, but they're really low tier, and I'd prefer that uh, these guys shoot at them than my actual infantry. Hmm. Nice tartan. Kind of in the game. People give uh, movies like Braveheart a hard time because uh, the tartan as we know it really doesn't appear until a little afterwards in the 1500s, 1600s. But I like to make sure to say that, you know, tartan is a concept, I mean, it's just plaid cloth. I mean, obviously, something like this uh, has existed long before the formalized, you know, heavy giant kilts. Uh, if you've ever seen the movie Rob Roy, uh, those, those are kilts. You know, these great big, as they say, the whole nine yards. It takes nine yards of cloth to actually make them. Okay, get our general in here. Get our skirmishers in here. Come on, everybody get in here. We have a fight to give. Let's get our line breakers. Here he is. Our general is under attack. Everybody's got places to go. Someone asked why do I always run people around? Uh, impatience, I suppose. Uh, this is a battle where I don't really need my spearmen so much, though, because uh, you know, just not that sort of battle. No real cavalry to worry about. But right here, we'll kind of walk on that last little bit. Where are my berserkers? All right, get in there, guys. All right, come on in. Let's get you guys out of the gateway. Ran into that problem last time. 
I like the new multi-tiered siege levels. They're a lot more interesting. I um, personally am not a big fan of sieges. I have a lot of flashbacks from Medieval 1 where I was never quite sure how I was going to do. I, I, I typically find that <laughs> I, I, it's better just to let the computer auto-resolve it than for me to actually fight the battles myself. Now, whether or not siege warfare was actually a huge part of the era is something else entirely. Um, there's a lot of situations where, you know, of course, Vikings ransacked towns like York when they were fighting. Um, the Vikings attacked York in, let's see, would have been the 80s, I want to believe. The Sons of Ragnar coming and fighting the King of Alba. I mean, they actually took him alive at that point, you know, and captured him. So, obviously, they did get into cities and they did cause problems. Berserkers. Let's see what these guys are capable of. Oh, so I actually can't control my Berserkers. I'm, I'm trying to click figure out where they are, but they're just in combat doing their thing and just hewing through these guys. But because of that, they're completely uncontrollable. Now, I think they're just going... Yeah, you can actually see it. Now, a lot of actual combat from the era was instead sort of taking control of you know, they would siege areas, but Vikings weren't quite good at, you know, taking the fortified locations. You know, you can surround a place and starve them out, and once they've been starved out, well, then they'll kind of force a submission of some kind. Um, actually trying to assault the walls, though, to means huge casualties, and I need to, speaking of casualties, I need to get my archers to stop firing, because they're shooting my own guys. See those berserkers with their swords up in the air, just charging around like crazy guys, trying to find the next person to attack. There they go again. Arms up in the air. Where's my enemy? Oh, that is so hardcore. <laughs> so you're gonna find, buddy. <laughs> Run all that way. It's a little Monty Python esque, but it's sort of fun. <laughs> all right, while that's going on. Obviously, we have this battle in the bag. I just uh, kind of want to see what's going on here. Let's see. These would be skirmisher cavalry, so if they run into anyone, they should skirmish back again. Hmm, Alban warriors. So these are going to be slightly more advanced troops. So that's probably why they're cutting through so many of my guys. Now, I would pull my berserkers back, but... Uh, that's not an option. Preservers don't give you that option. Alright, I am walking them, because as uh, somebody else pointed out, there's no reason to always exhaust everyone. <laughs> Cavalry, though, I don't mind so much. This is actually one of the great inventions of Alfred the Great, as they call him now, is what's called the Burr system. Um, basically, when I was talking a minute ago, the Vikings weren't very good at siegecraft. You know, it takes a lot of organization to keep an army in one place for an extended period of time. So what he decided to do to keep out the Vikings was to basically fortify several towns. So when the Vikings approached, hey, they'd have a wall. Well, you can't get through the wall. I mean, it requires you to build siege towers, rams, all that. So as cute as it is, there's a siege tower here. The real Vikings had a much harder time actually making those. It's pretty advanced. You know, catapults, trebuchets, none of that was really part of the warfare of the period yet. So all they had to do was sort of retreat behind the walls and wait for reinforcements to show up, and typically they did. I mean, these you know, the great Viking army had already dissipated at that point, so the easiest way to handle it was to pick it off piecemeal, one by one. You know, for when you think about castles, very few castles in the Middle Ages were taken by force. Typically, they were just starved out. I mean, you don't really have these great... I mean, you, you think about when they say they were impregnable, they weren't joking. These things really were just absolutely uh, fortresses that if you attack them, it's just a great way to get dealt with um, and murdered. <laughs> but, I mean, that's one of the reasons for the rise of cannon and things like that is, uh, is a new way to deal with the problem of castles. Now, let's see if we can do something fun here. We're going to keep one on one side and one on the other, and whenever they face one way or the other, we will pepper them in the back.
I'm actually curious if these guys can fire while riding. Doesn't look like they can. Come on, hit him. <laughs> hey man. Beauty of skirmisher cavalry. Obviously while this is going on. I'm sure let my guys getting up here. <laughs> and nothing they can do. This is one of my big complaints of the game, actually. I, I wish that when units got to about 50% morale, actually like that, I'm kind of impressed. Once units get to about 50% morale, I'd really like to see them all just kind of run off and not recover. Especially archers, you know, when you hit them with a group of cavalry, they're not going to come back to the battle. They're done. But in this one, you know, they just got to recover, they come back, whatever. I, I'd much more like to see sort of that panic set in. There's some really great mods for Attila where, you know, once morale got too low, the whole armies would just run away, you know. So here they deployed 766, 776, but lost 652. I mean, that's, jeez, 80% of their army dead? Uh, that never happened. I mean, your random peasant guy isn't going to stay next to his lord and die. He's like, yeah, pfft, butter this. You know, these guys are just as interested in have him actually go and plant and make money as they would be themselves. But they don't particularly care who farms the land. Someone's, someone's farming it. Might as well occupy you. And now that we've taken that, we can also begin using our guy here to sweep down the coast and start picking up Orkney scraps. Should be able to attack him from the sea and go from there. Yep, there he goes. Why do I keep forgetting this is a fortress? I don't know why I can't remember that. <laughs> I might never have it blockaded, so they're just sitting there making no money from it. And after a lovely cold winter, we can now right-click and assault this place in the far high workings. The slumbering wolf does not get the ham. I have never heard that proverb before. I like it, but I've never heard that proverb before. Uh, is there a way to, like, amphibious assault this place? That looks to be a no. Although... That is the more direct route. Belly, fighting downhill, will have a great advantage over those fighting uphill against them. Mm. Capture. <laughs> they have the high ground. Keep those lights the enemy tremble before our superior numbers. <laughs> Get ready with some nice axemen to kind of run in there and give everybody a bad day. Follow with everybody else. Good solid army. They're in range, so start firing, folks. I do like how uh, just gorgeous the Scottish Highlands are in these games. These really dark, smoky, foggy seas. Working has been getting it hard. I didn't realize you could set trees on fire, honestly. I haven't spent much time shooting at things randomly. Alright, these two guys are kind of competing, so I'm going to send the siege tower to the left. <laughs> the raider trait? Yeah, they can actually just come up and throw stuff at it. 
at you and just chunk stuff at the gate walls. Can you these guys light it up? The enemy approaches. Uh, well, it did no damage, so that's a waste of arrows, apparently. What does it say? 1%. Yeah, no, we're just going to shoot folks. <laughs> a far better use of our, our arrows. One thing I wish the game had done, um, even though I realized it wouldn't have been very fun, we were talking about historical authenticity earlier, uh, basically everyone was a spear infantry during the period. Uh, the sword is sort of a sidearm at best. Uh, we had an idea of what most people were using because of uh, how the Saxon feared was equipped. And we know from that that your average soldier would have, uh, your average, you know, levy soldier would have a shield, a javelin, a spear, and a horse. Um, and I think they were also required to have a helmet. Uh, and, and that's it. I mean, um, that's why archers, you know, you hear about them in the period, but you, well, how come you didn't see more of them? You know, obviously if they're unarmored like that, you should see archers all over the place. But in reality, it's just a matter of uh, getting enough archers into one location. You know, they, you have things like the Mongols who had an entire culture based around it, but otherwise it's just, you know, who's good with hunting and kind of show up at the time. But uh, that even that little armor, the shield, was 90% of what's uh, happening in the fight. You just hunker down behind it and trying to get out from behind it. You know, the arrows slam into it, doesn't do much. Um, but your average guy, like I said, just didn't have that much armor, actually. And that's why you get these stories of people taking arrows to the eye or arrows to the neck, because you know, there's nothing to really prevent it. Some axemen in there. Big two-handed axemen. I mean, yeah, that's where your ideas like the giant two-handed axemen come in. They can just chop through about anything. And, you know, it's different than a, it's slightly different than a woodsman axe. Um, if you can imagine, this is much more, it's, uh, shaped about like this. It goes out and then down and then kind of curves to the end. You can actually see here it's kind of curved. Um, the blade itself is actually very narrow. All it kind of, it's got a part where the haft goes in, very narrow, then flares back out again. It's sort of almost a diamond shape. Uh, so the weight is right on the edge of that blade. Um, if you use it to try and chop down a tree, the thing would dull in a couple of minutes. But uh, for chopping people, it was very, very effective. In this case, where it's uh, trying to run in and really rush people, that's probably the best idea possible. Just to use big two-handed axemen. weird place on the wall though is somewhat odd. I can't seem to, the second time this has happened where I'm on the gate and they want to just so can put him right here, see what happens. Like if they know to fight. Can they figure it out for themselves? I don't know. So Siege Battle is actually pretty fun in this one, you know, it's rather straightforward, and I keep shooting my own guys and really need to stop doing that. <laughs> Lure these guys over to where the rest of my troops are. That's actually a really advanced... Well, it's tier one. Oof. 
don't want to just charge Axemen right into the front of these guys, because those are the Eastern Spearmen. Oh, even after Half Dan. Soon Half Dan the Black. <laughs> One of the Half Dans. You'll notice a lot of these names are uh, repeated over and over again. Half Dan, of course, being half Danish. The half Dane. So, probably one of his parents is Danish. I always thought that was kind of neat. And you get, like, Ragnar Ragnar's son. Ragnar, son of Ragnar. do with these guys. Oh, I didn't need to. I was going to form them up and run back in and get in a wedge. And that's the battle. Heaped with riches. 100%. We're going to need a bigger haul. <laughs> you have played your hand immaculately, whether from neighbors paying you off, bested foes ambushing themselves for you, or distant freeing of or near your dues. You now receive tribute almost beyond measure, and with it, the universal acclaim and support of your people. Now that's the way to be a Viking. Jeez, those are some <laughs> crazy buffs. Basically makes so people just kind of flee as they're finding me. I'll just finish sort of sweeping up through here and take out Athfokla. Occupy. And then in the north, the only real army left for the Orkneys is down in the Thursa there. Maybe I can catch up pretty quick, but I'd like to start taking up a lot of their smaller settlements. Could raise another guy. Just sort of pop from one to the other around the edges here. I think I'm going to do that. So just raise a very quick army. Near before Baldar. Achievement unlocked. What did I do? <laughs> that achievement. Play the Viking Sea Kings. Rick's maximum possible CP level. Tribute level. That's right. Didn't even know that was an achievement. And someone, we were talking about cut features earlier as well, and someone mentioned Ambush Dance, and it's just not one I used in previous games, if I'm honest. I personally don't think it really has a place in this game either. Uh, this isn't Teutonburg Forest, you know, this isn't the Romans and entire legions getting waylaid by uh, barbarian hordes. This is, uh, you know, this is the area of set-piece battles, you know, military scouting and just basic knowledge of tactics advanced considerably from the Romans. You know, the Romans themselves passed on what they had learned, and uh, the ability to gain information on battlefields through scouts and uh, just the networks of information, just the knowledge to do that and the ability to do so made such a difference how battles played out. So as time goes on, you have less and less armies becoming completely surprised. Now, sure, an army may not be where someone expected to be, which has happened to me several times here, but the difference between, you know, being caught off guard and being caught with your pants down. <laughs> Go ahead and put the siege on those guys. Oh, apparently they're not even going to fight me. They're just going to let me have it. <laughs> wow, that's when you know you're beaten. You're just like, no, no, you can have it. Just, just no, I'm done. <laughs> We're done here. On a small level, though, like with my individual leaders, things like that, I do still like to having the ability to ambush. I think there's some use to that. Uh, you know, guerrilla warfare was still a thing in the period. I mean, all the way, like I said, the Welsh previously, they made huge inroads uh, into England during the 9th and 10th centuries, just raiding back and forth. You know, there'd be one guy and his 30 closest companions, right? And they'd run in and do all sorts of nasty stuff and come back again. And uh, so ambushing in that sense, yeah, it's there. But uh, like I said, that's not something you usually see on giant army levels. So I, I can understand why it was removed. Um, like I said, I think it has a place in the older games, but not necessarily in this one. It's much more about positioning, which is very true to the period. You know, just making sure you already know where you're supposed to be and be there. Go ahead and put the herd on these guys. Mm, that's sweet. Ooh, subjugate. Whenever I've subjugated in the past, it's always just resulted in people coming back from the dead and hating me. So let's not. 
Ooh, eastern lands sighted. The crossing was hard and the seas high and bitter winds, but the promise of riches the east through the expedition on. Now land is in sight and a myriad of eastern territories are within reach. Will a man push her here or continue onwards by whatever route they may return? Uh, well, we can assume that whenever we go further out, we always get more riches from it. You know, it takes more investment, more time, so let's continue Success east. Is rewarded. <laughs> this general has just become an absolute boss. A little more unit replenishment, I suppose. Why not? He keeps dying. Norse warriors can now be upgraded to Norse Hirsir. The Hirsir? Hirsir? Hirsir. Um, but just the basic word for just advanced warriors in Old Norse. We serve to the end. And we can go ahead and continue this little siege right here. But because the thing is only being blockaded, nope, we can go ahead and auto resolve that as well. Golly. I don't think that was supposed to look like a kick in the nuts, but uh, it did, and uh, that is a... Ooh, we can liberate Kirkin. <laughs> no. Talk about an organization that would not appreciate my coming. And just keep on raiding. Actually, let's just put you out right here to see. Why not? That's what Vikings do. If this current king ever dies, which I'm sure he eventually will, because, you know, that's something that happens to people, uh, he is going to be, we're going to be in a world of hurt when that time comes. Take Inverness real quick. This general, I think is my guy that's running, so let's give him as much campaign map movement as possible. We're going to have him just be our kind of guy that runs around and does crazy stuff. That's another one. Talk about removed. Removed features uh march stance or uh sorry yeah marching stance double time uh, another one that was removed and that's another one that yet again i'm sort of okay with uh you know the idea of the romans on the march while there were extreme feats of movement during this period um it wasn't because the armies just inherently did it i'll put it that way the ai cheesed the march stance on a regular basis thing we've all encountered it where the ai happened to know exactly what to do to attack and then somehow hit march stance and run away at the perfect moment um i myself run into that a number of times where i'm suddenly just chasing these armies all the way across the world and just annoyed the snot out of me so by removing it you know we're all kind of back on equal playing field again but like i said there are certain individuals that are known Tribute off the pedestal. Your hard work paid off. You're receiving as much tribute as your strength could hold. The last year no longer see quite as much bounty, but minimal average to recur without its own wealth. Oh, went down by one. Uh, tribute declines over time, so you have to kind of keep one up your rating. Your but, uh, you know, especially, uh, ironically, the loser of the Battle of Hastings, Harold Godwinson, was well known for the fact that he could inspire. He was well known to appear when people didn't expect him to these huge marches back and forth across england you know across wales and that was really kind of what made him famous his ability to move those troops so i'm fine kind of rolling march stance into a character ability because it's him that did it not the army itself if that makes sense the only thing left from orkney is a citadel at arc arcadon didn't move far enough away, Orkney. I want to fight a field battle. I haven't fought one in a while. I feel like I should... You normally skip this phase, but I kind of show you what my logic is. So I put my axemen, as well as swordsmen, in the front line. About like this. Oof. Come on. Something blocking them here? Uh, yeah, impassable terrain. Hmm. Easy. So let's do it like that. Uh, behind them, I like to have a reserve line of my axes that I can always kind of punch in with. Put the archers in front of them so they can be peppering the enemy. Uh, normally, if I have spearmen, I put them on each flank at this point, but we do have cavalry, so we'll put them here. Put our guys on each side. Use these guys as our basic reserves in case anyone tries to wrap around us and make sure our general stays somewhere pretty near the middle. Now, if I had spears, I'd keep them on both flanks right now in case cavalry showed up, obviously. Group them together. That was not what I wanted. <laughs> so we start moving them now, and we'll... Uh, 
can never remember the command to have everybody march together. I think it's shift or alt. So we'll speed up this part though. Skirmishers. Holy whoa. Okay. New plan. Get in the dodge. Set that forest on fire, shall we? Our general is under attack. These are levy skirmisher, so we don't want to get peppered by those, but we can avoid it. to charge in here, but can't get caught out just yet. Mm. Ah, everybody's default running, that's part of the issue here. <laughs> Now in this case, these guys should pretty much break the next couple of seconds here. Alright. Now it's time to deploy the horses. Hammer and anvil. Let's try and get some axemen right over there. Some epic sounding music. <laughs> What cavalry are good at? Getting into places they're not supposed to go. Oof. Unfortunately, we're lining up with Hearthguard right now, so we don't want to have to tangle with those guys. Let's get him back out of there. I do what to do with his nose. Good audio in that. Sounds of battle. Okay, guys, let's stop shooting at our own folks here, shall we? See, they flee before our might. Should be everybody in full flight. Except for these guys. Spear guard. Because they are elite tier 3 infantry. Which would explain why they're not backing off. But luckily we have a whole army to come over here and remind them exactly where their place is in the pecking order. Let's have our horsemen keep pursuing these guys off the map. There you go. 
your next stop is going to be right here, so you might as well get to it. We pledge your service. It's winter, so I hate to do this, but I want to kind of finish this off. Ooh, Stratkluth. They've decided to help out. I forgot Athbokla was allied with them. We should probably try and sue for peace. Stratkloot. The sooner we conclude, the sooner you can leave. Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> they didn't want any. We'll finish those guys off and kind of go from there. Hey, bodyguards and companions. Finally unlocked that. I think it's uh, getting by a skill level 10, so I managed it. Morale for Commander's Unit, Shield for Commander's Unit, Melee Commander's Unit, Martial Law, and <gasps> Royal Who Scarls. I suspect this is about to be a very silly battle. One-on-one uh, -on -one battle. Not worth anything. Finally. I like how neither one could actually kill the other one off. I kind of like that. There's these occasional just little single guys kind of running around with individual heroes. I was talking about a minute ago. Orkney is now on his last foot with one settlement remaining. So let's finish them off and then call this an end for the video. It's a good place as any to stop. Expedition out of supplies. A ship can only go as far as the shrink to sail. Once your ships are used to bother big tools and fresh water, all on board perish without sighting land again. Wow. Um, okay. Apparently, we had to land in Denmark. <laughs> I mean, we were sailing east, so we should have hit land. That's just goofy. I don't, I don't like that. that. That actually kind of annoys me. <laughs> I mean, you only get to do one, what, every like 10, 15 turns, and it doesn't really tell you what's going to happen before you get there. I don't, I don't, nah. Not a big fan of the... Uh, expedition mechanic for something that's supposed to be integral to them. It doesn't really have quite the impact I was hoping for. Alright, let's go ahead and surround this place so we can get them whittling them down. We may have to retreat out of that if they sally out because obviously we can't stop them. This is where I was talking about, sort of the peaceful moments. You know, I'm just kind of, I have a plan in place. Nothing crazy's happened, barring any sort of exceptional circumstance. Like, and eh, it's probably going to occur, so we'll back up a little bit. He's not going to chase me. You know, barring exceptional circumstance, invasions from Vikings, things like that. Ugh, another Viking. Uh, right, so let's go north this time. Why not? Who knows what we'll run into. Probably not Norway, apparently, because we couldn't find Denmark. Any questions you guys have about the game, I'm always happy to answer. Um, feel free to put them in the uh, comments below. I'll do what I can to answer. Um, hopefully, hopefully everybody's excited about this game as I am to play it. It's a heck of a lot of fun. I look forward to uh, seeing a lot of you guys online when the time comes. I'd love to do some sort of co-op campaign with some people. Yeah, I wondered if they were going to do that. <laughs> They're my neighbor directly to the south. I've been kind of pissing off for a little while now. Good thing I kept that army on the right hand side. Okay, looks like we're gonna have some farms and stuff here. Ooh, Scone Abbey, ancient capital of Pick, stands as a church of notable importance, so they have unique buildings in this. I actually didn't know that. Wow, yeah. Heck yeah. Build that. <laughs> I didn't know there were unique buildings in this game. That's actually quite cool. Alright. Expedition, Northlands in sight. The chills of the North Sea will last your shifts, but your men are stalwart now the Northern Lands are within reach. They land here, carry on, and return home. Well, based on what happened last time, uh, yeah, we should probably just land here because the Northlands, I assume, are like Norway. If we continue north, we're just going to freeze to death. Goodness, this increased research. You really start cranking it out as the turns go on. Just go ahead and take this location from them. A port. I need all the ports. And here we go there. No advantage on a night attack. Auto resolve. 
and that should be the end of Orkney. Now, just occupy. Faction destroyed, Orkney R. And that is the entirety of the Hebrides almost belonging to me. Now, next turn we'll come in and we will take care of these Scottish rebels. And of course, the Galgoidel, which sounds like Galgado. Join us on our next part of our campaign for episode 5, where we move out of the highlands down into the lowlands and start our raiding parties. So my goal is to take these ships and just work my way all the way down around the coast. We're currently at 11 out of 15 ports, so in the next two episodes we should probably make it to the end of our short kingdom victory. As always, thanks for watching, and if you have questions, or comments, or things you'd like to hear me talk about, leave them in the questions below. Obviously, you'll notice I'm kind of running out of random things to talk about here, but I'd be happy to apply any of my historical or archaeological knowledge to any questions you might have.